I'm Major Grant Thomas, and today I'm going to be presenting to you the ballistic missiles lesson. We've got lots of objectives, lots of equations, lots of fun, so buckle up. Our first objective is that, given the location of a launcher and a target, be able to calculate the range, azimuth, and flight path angle. Our next objective is to know what Q burnout is for a booster, how to calculate it. Third, we've got to know how to perform calculations associated with max range problems, such as Lambda max, phi max range, Q min. We'll discuss all of these terms in detail in the following slides. Um, the next objective is to know how to find the time of flight using the chart. Lastly, you should know how range angle and flight path angle are affected by a rotating Earth. So to begin with, what is a ballistic missile? What are, we, what are we actually talking about here? And really what we're discussing here is a missile that travels beyond Earth's atmosphere up into space, and then it's going to use Earth's gravity to fall back to Earth in a ballistic fashion. So most of its flight is going to be unpowered. Its payload is going to differ from our launch velocities lesson where our payloads were typically satellites. In this case, the payload of our rocket is going to be a warhead. More often than not, it's going to be nuclear. Um, ballistic missiles have several advantages over conventional missiles as well. They have much longer range because they're able to get up outside of Earth's atmosphere. And they have much shorter travel time from the launch site to the impact site because they're up outside of Earth's atmosphere. So they can go essentially from continent to continent in, in 30 minutes. So pretty incredible. All right, so the rest of the lesson, we're going to kind of introduce some more of the geometric terms that you're going to need and some of the uh, math and how these actual missiles arrive from their launch site to their actual target. So our first term is that of range angle, and that's lambda. We call this the trajectory path or range angle. And really what it is, it's almost an angular distance that would define our launch site here to our impact site over here. And if this NP is the North Pole, so we're looking down on the globe here, so it's like an angular distance. Uh, in order to really define this quantity, we need several different things. We need some information about our target um, and about our launch site. That information is our latitude and longitude. So here, the big L is going to represent our latitude, so this LT would be the uh, latitude of our target. LO would be the latitude of our origin point or our launch site. Uh, little LO would be the, lat, uh, the longitude rather of our, of our uh, launch site. And little LT would be the uh, longitude of our target point. So we have an equation down here um, that's given which basically says that our range angle is going to be related to our latitudes of our, of our origin point and our target and the uh, difference in longitude between those two points. All right, so um, our next geometric term is that of launch azimuth, which we're going to define as beta, which you've probably seen uh, in many other lectures. Uh, we like to use beta for our, our direction, so that's good. And so we define that um, conventionally um, from north in the clockwise direction. So um, what would our launch direction be if we're launching from the United States, say, over here to the, the South China Sea? If we're going to actually go in this direction, we would use a beta that was related to that angle that you would see shown here. And one thing to remember is that north is pointing towards the North Pole. It's not necessarily just up. So don't let that confuse you when you're looking at your uh, different problems. You have something on your equation sheet that actually has a relationship uh, that you can derive explicitly. And that says that cosine of beta, or our launch azimuth, is equal to um, a relationship between our latitude of our target, our latitude of our origin point, and our latitude of our origin point again. And, uh, and again, these are range angles that we just calculated before. So there you go. So that's, that's how you can calculate your direction that you need to launch. Okay, our next geometric quantity that we're going to kind of define and that you'll need for your uh, equations that you're going to be working through is that of a trajectory parameter. It's really a relationship um, that we're going to call our rocket power. It's really this non-dimensional quantity we call Q. Um, and Q basically can be defined, um, most rockets have a Q less than one in which they can go the short way from their target. So they basically have an elliptical trajectory that impacts the Earth at two points, really here at the launch site and then over here at our target. Um, or you could have something that has a Q of greater than one, uh, in which case our rocket has a V burnout that's greater than V circular. In other words, it can achieve orbit and we can hit any different location on the surface of the Earth. So uh, if we have a really powerful rocket, a really high Q number, uh, then this allows us to be more flexible in what targets we can actually hit and achieve. All right, so what is Q burnout? So Q burnout is related to our V burnout, our velocity at burnout. 
and our R at burnout, so R again is our position from the center of the Earth to wherever our rocket would be at when it reaches its max altitude, over the mu of the Earth. If Q burnout again is less than one, you can only go the short way. If Q burnout is greater than one or equal to one, you can reach anywhere on Earth. So increasing Q means that you're changing the shape of your trajectory. All right, so the next quantity that we're gonna define is that of flight path angle. And uh, we call that phi, so phi burnout. And really to kind of understand this, we kind of have this hokey drawing over here in your book, but it's actually pretty useful in this case. Uh, imagine you have a garden hose and you're trying to, you know, spray your dog because you know, he's, he's dirty, I guess, and you're trying to wash him off. Anyway, so you basically got a, a hose that you can either, you can use this low trajectory and hit him like this. You can hit this high trajectory here, or you could actually use this kind of middle, in the middle range here and actually overshoot him. So typically we don't want to do that unless we're just trying to see how far we can possibly spray this hose. Um, potentially somebody's walking by over here and we want to get them wet as well. So this would be our max range. We're going to kind of use this example uh, to illustrate what our fees are going to be because we're basically going to have two different fees. We're going to have a fee uh, burnout high should be kind of like the high trajectory. So it's a path that we would achieve or take to, to hit our target and we go up way high. Um, this allows us some advantages uh, to get up outside of Earth's atmosphere as fast as possible. Uh, so it allows us typically to be more accurate because we're basically spending less time in the uh, region of Earth's atmosphere. We experience the most drag and the most, most uncertainty. Uh, you've got an equation for that on your equation sheet here. It's related to um, our range angle again and Q burnout. We've also got a Q burnout low, which it has another equation here. So both the Q burnout low and the Q burnout high would hit the same point. They would just take two different paths to get there. So there you go. And then if we wanted to, we could actually find the max range of our flight path angle. So this might be useful if, for instance, we were trying to consider uh, the the furthest target that we could hit from a particular launch site. Uh, this is the equation that we might use. We, we might use this uh, max range equation, which is related to our range angle again. Um, and we can also calculate our max range angle. And to do that, you need to know how strong our rocket is or really what our rocket power is and specifically Q burnout. So that we've got an equation for that. So that allows us to know the maximum range angle that we can actually hit. And then we've got our minimum trajectory parameter to reach a particular target. In other words, if we have a particular target, what's the smallest rocket that can actually get me there? And so I have an equation for that as well, and it's related to, again, range angle. There you go. All right, we've talked about a lot of equations. We've talked about a lot of different things. Is there an easier way? And it turns out, yes, actually there is. There's a table. So I'm going to show you the next few slides how to use a table. So if you would prefer, you can actually use the table instead of using your equation sheet um, to actually get some of these answers. So a table is going to look in general like this, um, but we'll talk about it in more details. It's called the table or the chart. Uh, so there you go. You can find copies of it in your book as well. So our first uh, question here would be, um, let's say that we had a particular rocket that had a Q of 0.9. So um, it has a Q of less than one, so we're, we're only going to be able to go the short way. Um, and we have a range angle that's 82.6, so this would be given to you in a particular problem. Um, how could I use this chart to actually calculate what my fee might be? So how would, I, how would I go about using this chart? So there's a lot of different axes here, so we'll kind of define these things as we go. Um, but the first is, you've got these uh, along the x-axis here, you've got degrees and it says range. So this is actually our range angle. So this would be essentially our lambda. Uh, and then we've got these blue lines here that are kind of these arced lines. These are our Q values. So we have a Q of 0.9, so we can already kind of idea, identify what blue line we're going to trace out. Uh, and then we've got several other values as well. Uh, if you look, you've got these red lines coming down this way, and those are our flight path angles. So those are our fees. And, and then last but not least, we have these values over here, which are, um, it looks like 0 0.2, 0 0.25, 0 0.3. That's our time of flight. Uh, over our P circular. So we're going to talk about that in the subsequent slide. Uh, but basically, we're going to be able to use this chart to calculate our time of flight, which well, is actually going to be pretty handy. Uh, one more thing I'll identify for you. We've got this line here, this green line that goes right through the center of all this. And this says, it says maximum range. 
So this is going to be our line of maximum range. So since we're taking the short way, uh, we've got a maximum range that we can hit. And anything below this line is going to be our low trajectory. And anything above this line is going to be our high trajectory. So this would be like anything that we're, you know, if we're using the water hose example, this would be like the low example to hit the dog on the, on the low arcing path. And then the high trajectory would be the high arcing path to hit the same dog. So there you go. All right, so to come back to our question. So what is my flight path angle if I knew these two things? How do I use the chart to do this? Well, I can start by identifying just the, the two things that I had just talked about. So my Q is 0 0.9. So if my Q is 0 0.9, that means I can already kind of identify what um, blue line I'm going to be along. And then I'm going to find my range angle of 82.6. So that's approximately here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually draw a straight line up like this. And what I find is that I actually intersect at two different points. So I intersect this uh, particular um, target at two different points. And what does that really imply? It means that I have two different flight path angles that would allow me to hit my target. Well, um, in the problem, we might say something like, oh, we want you to only look at the high trajectory. So if we ask you to look for the high trajectory, then you would pick off this point. Um, okay, great. If I asked for the low trajectory, that would be this point right down here. Okay, so what is my question really asking me? It's asking me for the flight path angle. So what is my flight path angle? Well, I identified these red lines before, and what I find is that I'm right here on this point. I'm between 50 and 40 of a flight path angle. In fact, I'm not quite halfway, and so if I was doing the problem, I would say that I'm approximately 42.5. Uh, which is pretty close. Uh, for your for your GR or what have you, um, if you're using the chart and you estimate these things, and as long as you're pretty close, that should be sufficient for us. Um, we're not necessarily looking for uh, multiple significant, significant figures or anything like that. All right, so um, how do I use this chart to calculate my time of flight? Because I, I kind of teased that out uh, earlier, so let's discuss that in detail here. So how do I use this same chart? So let's imagine that we still have the same problem. We have a Q of 0.9, a range angle of 82.6 degrees, and a flight path angle of 42.5 degrees. What is my time of flight, and how would I actually go about calculating that? Well, um, I'm at the same intersection point since all the things were before. Again, I'd have to tell you explicitly, uh, look at the high trajectory, so that's something that you would have to do. Um, you could also draw a line straight across here over to look at this TOF, TOF over p uh ratio. And what I find is that I get about, um, I found that to be 0.58 of p circ, which we're going to talk about here in just one minute. Um, so um, for right now, you would just write down 0.58 p circ. Next, you could calculate your max range. And how do I do that? Well, for that, I look at my green line. And so I have the same rocket because the rocket is what I have. It has a 0.9 Q. And so that Q puts me right here at this point right there. That's where I intersect this green line. And what does that mean? Well, it means if I wanted to figure out the farthest possible target that I could hit, it's 110 degrees away from me in terms of lambda. So there you go. So that would be 110 degrees. Um, and then lastly, we have this... Uh, phi max range. So what is my phi max range? Well, I can actually identify two lines here that bracket my max uh, point here where my phi or my lambda rather max range is at and I'm closer to 20 than I am to 10. I said that's approximately 18. Sorry, it's clipped off there in the video, but you can get the idea. So that's how you use the chart. Um, so in the previous slide, I just mentioned that um, you wrote 0.58 of p, of p circ as your time of flight. Well, that doesn't sound like a time of flight that you've calculated before, but it turns out that if you wanted to, p circ is actually the circular orbit period. And we have lots of equations for the period, but um, in this case, we're going to assume a circular orbit, and we're going to use our burnout for the dimension of our actual orbit. And so I can calculate what that period is. And my time of flight is going to be uh, this number here, which we calculated from before. So if we were using the previous slide, that'd be 0.58 multiplied by p circ. And that gives us our time of flight. So that's how you use the, the chart to actually calculate a time of flight. But we all know that the Earth is actually rotating. And most of the things we've been talking about previously, we're talking about our Earth 
that wasn't rotating. So what does what effect does a rotating Earth have on our actual ballistic missile trajectory? Because our ballistic missile is traveling for maybe 30 minutes in the air, which is a significant amount of time if we don't take into account the fact that our target's going to be moving under us while we're actually trying to go uh, trying to go meet it then we're actually going to be off target. So we have to take that into account. So how do we actually go about doing that? Well, we have an equation for that. Um, and basically, it's related to the Earth's angular velocity, which is not surprising. It's 15 degrees per hour. And we can figure out what our actual correction needs to be to our range angle using this equation. Here's another just kind of image of what this might look like. So as our Earth is rotating, our target um, is kind of spinning underneath us, so we need to kind of um, be able to anticipate where it's going to be and aim for where it's going to be, not necessarily for where it is. All right, so here's the kinds of questions that you might see um, on a GR and the kinds of things that I would expect you to be able to um, kind of reason through uh, when we give you something about taking into account the fact that Earth's rotating. So if we're launching eastward and the Earth's actually rotating eastward, uh, the impact on our range is that our range is going to go up. So if our range goes up, that has a particular impact on our flight path. And to think about this, I like to use this chart that we were talking about before, kind of with the dog. Um, so this is our low path here, and this is our high path. If our range is actually moving closer towards this max, so it's moving out towards the red, then what do I need to do if I'm on the low flight path angle? Well, if I'm on the low flight path angle, I actually need to crank up my angle just a little bit so that I can actually get out to this target. And if I'm on the high flight path angle, I actually need to decrease my angle just a little bit so that I can actually hit this target a little bit further out. And what's the impact on my time of flight? Well, if I'm launching eastward, my time of flight is going to go up because the Earth is going to be essentially rotating underneath me. Um, if I'm on the low uh, flight trajectory path. So if I'm on this path here, then my time of flight is actually going to go up. And if I'm on the high path, since I'm now choosing just a slightly lower angle here to hit my target, my time of flight is actually going to decrease just a little bit. All right, so that was all for eastward. What about if I'm going westward? Um, well, if I'm launching westward, things are going to be just a little bit different. In fact, they're going to be almost exactly opposite, right? So my range is going to actually decrease uh, because the Earth is going to be actually moving towards me, I guess, as I'm launching out towards uh, towards the particular target. Uh, for, the f for the flight path angle, my low trajectory is actually going to have to decrease because I'm trying to hit a target that's a little bit closer to, the, to me than where... Uh, than I would typically think with a non-rotating Earth. If I'm taking the high path, I'm going to take a little bit higher path to actually achieve this point. Uh, for time of flight, uh, my time of flight for the low path is going to go down, and my time of flight for the high path is going to go up. So make sure that you're familiar with this chart and kind of the impacts that a rotating Earth would have on our trajectories. Um, and that's the kinds of questions that you might see on a GR. All right, so that was the ballistic missiles lesson in a nutshell. I've told you how to basically figure out what the range, azimuth, and flight path angle are. I've taught you about what Q burnout for it, what it is, and how to calculate it. Uh, how to perform the calculations associated with the max range. Um, how to use the chart. I talked all about the chart. And go back and look at those examples if you want some more some more help on that. And then I've talked a little bit about what the effect of a rotating Earth is uh, for our ballistic missile from leaving our um, actual launch site to actually impacting a particular target. I hope we find that useful. Thanks, and we'll see you next time. Hi, I'm Major Grant Thomas, and I'm going to be doing your structures tutorial. Here we go. All right, so for today's tutorial, um, I actually took this um, problem from the Spring 15 GR3 with Answers, uh, page 7. So this is a page... Uh, from a GR, and this is similar to what you might see uh, for a structures problem on an exam. So this is not an exhaustive tutorial, but that should give you an idea of the kinds of problems that you might be asked to solve. So the first question is, um, it says, circle all that apply. Why is it important to determine the fundamental frequency of a satellite? And then you have four choices. So we're expecting you to circle all that apply, so you might circle more than one here. Um, let's see. So the first uh, answer says, 
uh, to ensure that the satellite can fit into the payload fairing on top of the rocket. So um, this is not the right answer because um, you basically, uh, when we're talking about fundamental frequency, we're not really talking about volume as much as we're talking about mass. So specifically, fundamental frequency is a relationship between stiffness and mass. And um, this, this question, uh, the part A here is saying, um, why can't we, talking about fitting it into the payload fairing on top of the rocket, that's a volume kind of question, so that one's not going to apply. All right, so part B. Um, why is it important to determine the fundamental frequency of a satellite, part B, to ensure that the frequency does not interfere with communication. So this is uh, not correct because it's talking about a different kind of frequency. This is the frequency uh, with, that we might deal with when we're talking about signal to noise. Um, that's going to be different than the, uh, the, the fundamental frequency. All right, part C. Um, why is it important to determine the fundamental frequency of a satellite? To help calculate the effects of the satellite propulsion system at the end of life. All right, so this one's not the correct answer because um, we don't really have any kind of relationship uh, that we have explicitly drawn here between stiffness and mass and the propulsion end of life. Um, sometimes, usually when we're talking about end of life with these kinds of questions, we're really talking about the uh, EPS system. We're not talking about that here, so this one's also not going to be correct. All right, so the correct answer is actually D. Um, it's to determine that the satellite will not be damaged in the launch environment. Um, this is basically so that the, um, the satellite is going to have a uh, fundamental frequency, which is going to be its lowest natural frequency, and we don't want that to be activated by the launch vehicle. The launch vehicle is actually um, going to swing through multiple different frequencies, um, and so we don't want the launch vehicle to activate this fundamental frequency. So the correct answer in this case would be D. All right. So that's the, an example of the kinds of problems that you would see in terms of a word problem with structures. Let's talk about an actual math problem here. Okay, so this one said, given the following satellite and three launch vehicle options, which launch vehicle provides the most margin? And then what is that margin? Um, and then it gives you some, um, some uh, actual uh, givens here. It tells you that the satellite mass is 110 kilograms and its structural stiffness constant is... 9.5 times 10 to the 6 newtons per meter. And then it gives you several different launch vehicles. Well, uh, to begin with, what I would do for this problem is calculate what the fundamental frequency of the satellite is going to be. Um, and for that, we actually have an equation on our equation sheet. Um, the fundamental frequency is going to be equal to 1 over 2 pi times the square root of k over m, where k is our stiffness and m is our mass. So if we're going to plug in the values that we have here given, that would be uh, 9.5 times 10 to the 6 newtons per meter divided by uh, 110 kilograms. Uh, if you do the math there, uh, we'll see. I don't know if you can see my, my calculator here. I'll bring it over here to this sign. Uh, you'd have 1 over 2 pi times the square root of the quantity 9.5 uh, times 10 to the 6 newtons per meter divided by 110. And I got that the fundamental frequency here was 46.77 hertz. All right, so that's the fundamental frequency of our satellite. So that number basically means um, when we are resonating at this 46.77 hertz, um, if, the, if the launch vehicle is vibrating at that frequency, um, our spacecraft is going to be going crazy because that's, that's basically its natural frequency or its fundamental frequency, its lowest natural frequency. Okay, so now we can answer these questions about margin. So let's look at these three um, launch vehicles. And for all of these problems, basically what we're going to want is we're going to want the fundamental frequency of our spacecraft to be greater than the fundamental frequency of the launch vehicle. So this one's our satellite. The fundamental frequency of the satellite needs to be greater than the fun F max of the launch vehicle. Well, um, we can actually look here at the problem, and we can see that two of these values, this 43 and the 45, are both <clears throat> less than this 46. This 48 is not going to work altogether because this, this Atlas V is actually going to have a negative margin. So if I was to, to calculate the Atlas V um, margin, 
that would be our spacecraft fundamental frequency minus the fundamental frequency max of our um, of our launch vehicle here. Um, and in that case, you're going to get a negative value, right? So what is, you could do it here, 46.77 minus 48. I got negative 1.23 hertz. Um, okay, and so which one of these is going to have a better margin? Let's look at the Falcon first. So Falcon margin, that'd be 46.77 hertz minus uh, 45 hertz. And that's going to be 1.77 hertz. And then the Atlas, sorry, the Antares, or Antares uh, margin would be that same 46.77 of our spacecraft minus the 43, uh, which in this case would be 3.77 hertz. And that's going to be the best margin. So this is going to be the best rocket, the best launch vehicle, um, because it's basically going to give us the most margin. Falcon would also work. It's got a positive margin, um, but it's not as much as the Antares, so we're going to go with the Antares. Uh, so that's why the answer here is 3.77, and Antares is circled. All right. So that wraps up our structures video. Um, I hope you found that tutorial useful. Um, the main thing to remember is that you want to keep the fundamental frequency of your spacecraft greater than that of the launch vehicle, and you should be good to go. Um, the way that you can change your fundamental frequency is to by either increasing the stiffness or decreasing the mass. Increasing the stiffness is oftentimes not something that you can do um, because you're going to be limited by the materials that your spacecraft is made of. Um, but decreasing the mass, um, that is something that you could possibly do. And that might be one way that you could uh, increase the fundamental frequency of your spacecraft um, and more easily get to orbit on a wider variety of launch vehicles. That's it. See you next time.